good evening. Um, my name is Nancy Corning. I've got the pleasure to introduce uh, Christopher Meyer this evening. I worked for a little while at ArchiZoom, and part of my part of my job was to select um, people for this series of lectures in association with the Hannes Meyer exhibition. So, um, in ArchiZoom, we we asked ourselves who could we, you know, who were the sort of contemporary architectural practices that we could that could be discussed within the context of Hannes Meyer's ideas, so within, within the context of the co-op, the cooperative way of working. So there are a number of reasons why we chose uh, Ramla Bor Berlin, and this particular Christoph Meyer. So firstly, due to a kind of small spelling mistake, we realized that in actual fact, they could probably be related. <laughs> Christoph Meyer, Hannes Meyer. Um, so, and secondly, um, so their way of working and, and really challenging traditional architectural practice by, by spending time on site, by collaboratively producing projects, producing architecture, but also producing urban space. This is something that Kenneth Meyer was um, talking about, the fact that the process of building is a, a very important collaborative act. And so thirdly, and lastly, their, um, their kind of activist approach, which um, <coughs> It, they, they intervene in, um, in really in politically charged contexts, even though they wouldn't call themselves a political, political office. Uh, what happens is that in places where traditional architectural practice also really can find no answers. So um, this is carried out with um, a huge per uh, sense of personal commitment, that's what I was talking about, spending really time on site, a huge sense of fun. And also, the, the, the way they go about this triggers a new sense of possibilities for these kind of very difficult contexts. Uh, so in the meantime, uh, Ramla Boyle uh, Berlin have been working for, I've forgotten how many years, but they're very experienced and now they're highly respected in the Arctic community and they're very busy flying to Rio, Melbourne, uh, teaching but also um, uh, consulting with local authorities uh, it's exactly in these quite difficult contexts. So, uh, Christoph, that's enough from me, and I, it's my pleasure to uh, hand it over to you and um, to hear what you do and how you do it. Thanks, Nancy, for the introduction, and uh, thank you for having me here. Unfortunately, I do not speak French, so uh, I uh, have to speak English, as you don't understand German, probably. It would be much easier for me. So, I prepared some notes and <laughs> probably have to write the most, at least at the beginning. Um, my presentation tries to reflect our work in the, the context of collaborations and commoning. It will be a combination for uh, a combination of positionings and narratives. I strongly believe that architects do need a position in society today. I also believe that our cultural being together works through a sophisticated way of retelling narratives. It's very hard and very peculiar to introduce new narratives or shift existing ones. But it's happening every day. While I was growing up in a society with a was the dominating narrative of Chancengleichheit, which means equal opportunities for all. We saw a gradual shift to the today's neoliberal paradigm of performance, competition on the one side, and scarcity and austerity on the other. We like to look at narratives as a way to work on the construction of a common ground. This is us in 2010 when we had a show at the Museum of Art in Bregenz. And I really like this picture because it describes our practice in a very pointed way. As you can see, the passerby walks into the picture and for me it, he represents the unpredictability of planning and uh, he represents everyday culture, which is both a crucial part of our work and we consider this as crucial parts of open design processes. So Raumlabo, I would say, is a form of collaboration, which we, star which we started in 1999 after graduating from university. Although we are all trained architects, our practice is at the edge of architecture, urbanism, art and activism. Most of us already met in our first year of studying architecture so when we started our practice, we already had some common years of uh, experiences and work. We started our practice in a former retail shop that we rented as a studio for doing our diploma. 
we kept this space after graduating. It became a social place where we met in the evenings after finishing work that we did to pay our bills. With its big shop window to the street, it had a public character, which was a trigger for shaping our practice. Very often we were asked about our influences, and of course our work can be related to the avant-garde of the 60s and 70s, like Cedric Price, Archigram or Super Studio, or even to the Situationist, if you go back further. But above all, it's our own experience in the post-Berlin Wall time of the 90s that are most relevant for our spatial practice. We talk about an architecture as key profession to manage urban transformation processes and to raise new imaginations for urban futures. We do this by creating intermediate forms and formats. Our spaces are spaces of action and nego negotiations. They are built on the belief that space is a product of social interaction. Bye Bye Utopia was the title of our show in the Kunsthaus in Bregenz, saying that today there is nothing like an utopian vision for the future. Today, the future is something to fear, something confusing, and there is a big desire for the time and everything seems to be so clear and safe. Whereas back in the 60s and 70s, there was a different narrative. The future was something colorful, full of, as full of aspiration, that things will be better for each of us, and technology was something that would improve our lives. When we did this drawing, which adds quite a lot of our projects into a cityscape, we realized that we probably cannot create a bigger vision, but many islands that we call kind of real utopias. So that working with the conditions of the contemporary city is, and, and improving it on small spots, creating small islands as kind of testing uh, situations is what we are about. It's not about creating a new vision for a society. So this is 1989. This was not only when most of us started their architectural studies in Berlin, but the year of the wall, of the, when the wall came down in Berlin, and in succession the collapse of the Eastern Bloc, which was the trigger for a globalized neoliberal capitalism, which in the end still had a big impact on our cities and still has. The world and its meanings and interpretations, it's a cultural construct. It is between us, that this construction happens. In our actions and decisions, we are taking part in reconfiguring the world. As the scale of the world is enormous and abstract, we are seeking in our work to create links back to the experience, where each individual's decisions matters, so the collective shaping of the world and its futures become tangible. <coughs> With architecture, we build our futures. We, in Raumlobo, work on prototypes of possible futures. We do this by creating life situations. We transform places temporarily and induce frameworks for collective action. Acting is very important to us. An experienced potential is better than a concept of, of a potential. Acting as if is acting too. Now I will talk about, I think, four projects, both uh, in Berlin, starting with a project uh, we did in 2006. It's about the um, Temple of Airport. So we were uh, invited, amongst some other offices, to, to take part in the workshop to think about activating strategies for the Temple of Airport after its closure. As a result of the workshop, Raumlabor, Studio Urban Catalyst, and MBUP were commissioned by the Senate of Urban Planning to work on a study on how to implement our first ideas in a longer process. This was a moment of time. Sorry. So, and in 2007, there was a re referendum plan to keep the airport running. And uh, the closure was actually part of a contract determining to close Berlin's inner city airports, Tegel and Tempelhof, to build a new airport in Schönefeld. Uh, this decision was originally pushed by the Conservative Party when they were running Berlin and being questioned when they were in the opposition. And I think this is pretty much how politics work in Germany. And I think it's, I think it's quite different here in Switzerland, as far as I know. And I think the referendum was one of the reasons why we were commissioned by the Senator from the Development of Berlin to work uh, on a study of for an alternative urban development for the airport area, because back then there was nothing or the real estate market was pretty relaxed. 
and it was quite clear that they couldn't implement their master plan. So they were quite pressured to hit uh, and had to justify the decision to close the, the, the airport, knowing that nothing will happen for years. So just for those that are not that familiar in Berlin, uh, showing an old city map from the 20s, uh, which I quite like because of having, this is the old Tempelhof Airport building, and this is the one that was built by the Nazis in the 30s. And because uh, I like it, it's the same situation that we have now in Schönefeld again, having two kind of airports at the same time. <laughs> one is working, the other is not going to be finished. Which actually happened uh, as well with this, because this wasn't uh, opened when it was planned to be opened. So, but this is not the issue here. I just want to, to show how big the area is in the context of the city, and this is quite close to the center of Berlin. And actually, this area has never been built or developed. This used to be kind of an uh, open area for military practices. And uh, I think it's, it's, it's part of the collective memory before, because of the, the airlift from Frankfurt to Berlin after World War II. And actually, this was a condition we had to work with. This was the master plan developed in 1998 by uh, the Berlin architect Bent Albers and the Swiss landscape architect Vogt and Partner. So their concept was the so-called airlift park in the center, framed by a boulevard of, and urban developments along that boulevard, so around the French. So here you can see what I mentioned before. This is a kind of uh, um, a picture showing uh, a plane landing on the airport, and the kids are waiting for the things to arrive. And I think this was a, another reason why a lot of people want to keep the airport running, because it was kind of, apart from it being kind of uh, political manipulated. Um, but at the same time, uh, I found it quite interesting that those people who were living next to the airfield were voted against the closure. And I was wondering because they had the, I think they had the noise and uh, the, the, the emission of, of kind of the airplanes. But actually they were afraid of changes that are going to happen because I think the, the area I shown here was always really disconnected from the city because of the airport. Uh, being all around, and it um, happened that this would be a kind of really um, interesting area to, be, to develop. So actually this was what we found, uh, I would say, like space and abundance, like really 3.8 million square meters of uh, open space, and uh, a building with uh, approximately 300,000 square meters, which is one of the, I think, supposed to be the biggest airport building as a, as a whole building. And uh, this is how we felt the situation like there's some point when the last plane is going to leave and there's some point in in the future some times in the future when the master plan is going to be implemented and built and there's something like a time gap in between and this is like i i, I said before it was really a moment of ti in time that we were commissioned and we really kind of uh, were excited about having the possibility to to shape uh, a place in berlin and to uh, think about new ways of uh, um, development. <coughs> and uh, we imagined to develop this time gap following the strategy of the Venetian Bridge. This is a kind of really uh, funny diagram by a Dutch uh, <laughs> urbanist called Joren Saris. And uh, what he tries to describe is that if you don't know what's going to fit in a kind of a situation, you have to test and experiment and find out what, what, what is the best. So you have to stimulate a lot of ideas, being really open and, and, and uh, support diversity. So in a, in a specific time frame, we thought maybe, maybe we need five years to find out what, what, be, what, what will be the best on, for this area. And then after this time, we need to kind of make decisions and um, define long-term concepts and consolidate the whole concept. So at the same time, because uh, the funny thing was to us, uh, not only the Department of Urban Planning uh, asked to make studies, but uh, even the Department of Green Planning and other departments asked like uh, other people to make studies. Uh, and some suggested to make an online uh, dialogue. Uh, it's a digital form of participation. 
and for us, the result was pretty predictable. So this is a kind of uh, polemic drawing about what uh, the result, like uh, collecting all the results. <coughs> because uh, we think this kind of um, participation produces uh, wrong expectations. Because people s then start to think, well, I, I feel like a client, so it's like Christmas, I won't have like a really big building, a tower, a mountain, a sea, whatever. And then nothing happens. And the funny thing is, the, the idea that was um, awarded was from like a 17-year-old 17, 17 teenager. He suggested to make a, a skate park. And then I think it took almost four or five years to, to make this skate park. And then this guy was like 22. And I think you have to imagine being 17, I think five years, it's something way off your imagination, imagin imagination. So I think even in the way to implement that, yes, they're really kind of uh, not successful. So um, we thought instead of uh, producing wrong expectations, we, we want to, 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 to launch a realistic discourse. And this was actually what we tried to do. So we, we started to trigger dialogue and exchange by organizing two conferences at the, as the kickoff for, for an open process. Uh, we invited many people, mainly from Berlin, but as well from all over Europe, like from Basel, people from the Interial, Philipp Caban was in Berlin, and uh, from uh, Amsterdam, I can't remember her name, but I think these were kind of really experienced people in um, cultural entrepreneurship to develop urban, urban situations. So we wanted to collect all kinds of expertise in urban transformation to identify possible actors for the process of Tempelhof. So that's why I did not only talk to planning experts, but as well to cultural experts, alternative entrepreneurs, sociologists, economists, local experts, and so on. Especially I think the local experts are always kind of important to us because it's like the expertise of, of everyday life. And uh, I think it's for us really a form of collaboration it's not that what I described before that they say what they want, but I think they have something that they can contribute to the process of development. And everybody brings his own expertise, so I think it's kind of uh, a process of negotiations. So what we wanted <coughs> to create was a platform for formal and informal planning, combining top-down and bottom-up processes. Uh, using the tactics of the temporary as a strategy for a new kind of urban development, which might sound complicated, but uh, was actually a very straightforward thought, because we, we, <coughs> we found that there is a lot of expertise uh, of informal planning in Berlin from the 90s, or after the wall came down, and a lot of things happened in this kind of area or in this field. And um, we thought we create a dialogue on eye level from these people with politics administration. But I think in the end uh, it didn't work out because I would say there was not enough trust or both sides didn't trust each other. So I think trust is always a kind of a big um, I would say a condition you need when you want to, to collaborate. Who you can see here is Ma Matthias Lilienthal, the former director of the Hebel Theatre which we invited at that time, and now he's, and he's in Munich, meanwhile. But before he left, we made a big um, project on the Temple of Area called uh, The World is Not Fair, which was a kind of world exhibition as a kind of theater piece over the whole airfield. The, the world is not fair? The world is not fair. So okay. the, big, the big world fair, the world is not fair. So like finding our kind of issues about what, what the world fair should be about, instead of like, showing the, who is the biggest and strongest nation. So um, f for us, import, uh, important for us was not only having the master plan as a kind of a long-term goal, because we believe that the, the future starts like now. So, um, and the master plan is usually broken down backwards to, to specific milestones to achieve the, the, the goals or the master plan at this is at, uh, the master plan was conceived. So um, we reversed the whole process by implementing at well, uh, as well as short-term goals through opening up the site for diverse activities. <coughs> and um, 
the idea was to create something like a slow urbanism as a learning process. I mean, this is a really abstract diagram. I mean, this was all done before uh, the airport was opened and we couldn't go there like once. It's more like creating a, a kind of a roadmap how, how it could happen. So I think the, the different colors represent different programs. And what we see now is like you start through activation and things going to happen and it becomes more and more diverse. And then uh, you see the long term goals. Sometimes back back here, there's the master plan. And then we had the, the IBA that was discussed, like the International Building Exhibition. And then the IGA, which is the International Gardening Exhibition. And there were some kind of uh, exhibitions going on. And the funny thing is that nothing <coughs> is there anymore. The IBA died because they were discussing too long. And it uh, moved from Tempelhof to Neukölln to Mitte. And then the, dis the discussion uh, stopped at some point, and um, they couldn't do it. The Eager was like moved from Tempelhof to the outskirts of Marzahn, for uh, some reasons I will uh, tell you later. Uh, the competition uh, Columbia Dam was an idea competition just to create uh, images. And I think as an architect, you always have to be aware that sometimes you really are used by the politics and administration because they, they need images and they need pictures to to show that they know what they do, but actually it's just, I don't know how, how to say it. Uh, 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 I don't know. <laughs> say it like. No, it's official. It's like it's, 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 it's a fraud, I, I, I think, at the architects, because I mean, they were really talking openly. Well, it's an idea competition, so what do they expect? So we need, we need pictures, that's all. Uh, <coughs> so what we did was developing sort of new tools as new layers on the uh, as new layers of the existing master plan so which could emerge within a given time frame so uh, I mean what we had to accept uh, although we, we tried to question it was the existing master plan as a kind of frame we had to begin into <laughs> but we thought we want to make a new analysis of the situation after the opening we want to discuss the concept we want to and make something like what we call the cultural exploration. We want to implement urban pioneers and uh, activate the site through, through, through use. And um, each of these layers had the feedback on the master plan. So I think this would shape the master plan in a kind of in a different way. And it's not like having the, the, the defined goal uh, uh, in, in the future, but I think it's more kind of flexible and adaptive to, to the needs that might come up. So this is um, uh, like our concept in, in 10 steps to make it really easy to communicate to the uh, politics. So um, I go through quite quickly what was important to say. We, we thought it needs some organizational structures that makes it easy for people to go to like a one-stop office if they have an idea, if they want to use some areas on the site, if they want to use part of the buildings, they have to, uh, they have some ideas, even if it's like business or cultural. So everything could be answered with, with one, in one office in the airport area. The other thing is was like building partnerships with kind of different partners like initiatives, cultural and, and social actors as kind of, I don't know, we always say it, multiplicatoren, I don't know what the word is, multipliers. Multiplicators, yeah. I know if it's kind of proper English, but then of course with media companies, institutions like uh, universities, uh, and so on. And the third was like open the fence, which actually seemed quite <laughs> obvious to us, but uh, which was not. I will come back to this later. And um, fourth was like start a cultural exploration program, which we thought might be necessary to do in the time after the airport is being closed and the time after the <laughs> airport is being opened for public as a kind of park and open area. So uh, because we could tell there might be a time where they need to solve all the problems of liability and kind of ownership and so on. And that's why I thought people really are interested in, in, in having a look at this area and experience the area. So that we, we, uh, that's why we suggested this. I uh, will call, uh, will explain this in detail. So the, the start, the field for urban pioneers uh, as a five-fifth point, open calls, which is kind of always a kind of valid 
a method to uh, to find people that uh, want to be engaged. Build a ring was more like a room related to the master plan, to, as a kind of a backbone to to con well, to to locate, locate different uh, programs, create special places. What we thought might be necessary because it's a really open area, and you feel like you needed some oasis to to have a kind of rest and, and go where you want to go on on the side, and uh, bundle activities, which was thought that we want to to make something like um, a Biennale on the side for like uh, alternative uh, um, uh, developments and what I described before linking activation and long-term processes so this is how the plans looked like uh, we, we were sort of forced to draw this kind of proper plans although it was and I think this some very pointless this is a plan describing the uh, cultural uh, uh, exploration and uh, <laughs> and this was always before the, the, the airport was like accessible for us and what we try to do is I mean this describes like funny movements around the, uh, the airfield but um, like I said before we, we thought there might be time when the airport is already closed but it's not open to public as a park and we knew that there's a big interest from from, from people to, to just experience this area. And it's really, it is, it is an experience. It's like um, if a big lake is frozen and you never can imagine how it feels like walking on the water. And then for, when I was there for the first time, it was really a stunning experience. So, uh, but this wasn't, um, uh, we, we weren't commissioned finally <laughs> because there was no budget left. That's what they said. And then this was the, uh, the other kind of plan uh, we were kind of asked to draw, defining kind of really things we couldn't define at that point, it's like all the different kinds of pioneer areas with describing the, um, the fringe and borders, how they uh, are kind of designed or if their clothes are open, which was not kind of possible to us, but I think we just did it. And this was actually like we imagined kind of the different uh, path of, of development for pioneers. And I think even the word pioneers we had to uh, invent because usually it's uh, called Zwischennutzung, which, which is uh, interim use. And, and it has a kind of bad reputation because interim users never go away. So we had to find something uh, which is kind of a, a positive implication. So we said it's pioneer, pioneer users, but which was really inspired by pioneer plants, which come after kind of industrial use is, is, is going away. And then different kind, a specific kind of plants come to the place and just grow, but uh, nothing needs to be done. So we made the difference between different kind of um, identities of pioneers, the ones that are really kind of interim users, they come and go, or they, they wander around. Uh, the other ones um, become like um, a, a part of the urban development because of the, uh, uh, being the identity of a kind of future neighborhood. And the others became, become really successful in being like the developers themselves. So and that's what our experience like, uh, more like the conversation with a lot of uh, people said that some of the interim users in Berlin became really successful and could start businesses, but they needed a specific time frame to test this. So that's why we thought about the five years. So um, after uh, the um, study happened uh, nothing for a long time. There was a last uh, flight in uh, 2008, October 25th. And uh, really for a long time, nothing happened. And uh, the administration even did not manage to communicate any idea or timeline of how and what and when. Um, there were things that need to be clarified, like the ownership of the area and issues like safety uh, for public use and liability. Uh, but people really got sort of skeptical uh, and a lot of rumors and even we kind of were kind of uh, accused because you were working for the Senate. It was a really difficult time. And what happened then was um, uh, a call, like have you ever squatted an airport? 
this was I, I, I think half a year later. So uh, it was <laughs> yeah half a year later, like or se seven months later. And uh, what happened that a lot of people just came uh, to to the airport and tried to climb over the fence, bringing plants, and uh, tried to occupy the airport. Um, which is quite funny because uh, actually what they tried to do is to um, occupy public space because I mean the area was public, and uh, there was on the other side a massive array of police, um, and they they tried to to avoid the people managed to climb over the, the fence and nobody um, made it in the end, I think. Uh, and I think on one hand it was kind of a traumatic experience for the administration because they didn't expect people trying so hard to, to fight for their right. And uh, on the other hand, the, for me the joke was that they spent like, uh, at least according to Indie Media, almost a million euro for the police operation. So if you would have taken this amount of money and given it to us, <laughs> making kind of the cultural exploration, I think there would have been so many opportunities to, to create a kind of positive access to this kind of area. But anyway, so then uh, another year, so it was like one and a half years after the, uh, the closure of the airport, there was like the big opening party with, uh, I think, 250 people, 250,000 people coming to see the new area. And uh, I think it was amazing because from the beginning people embraced the new public space. And I think it proved that there's no need for design. They just were there. And I think it's because of the size. What you can see here, it's always, uh, it's, it's always amazing. It's, it feels like being outside the landscape but having like uh, a skyline of the city around, right around you. So. Uh, this is a kind of normal weekend day, where you can see the all kinds of, of, of kites. So, and I think this is uh, a space that offers these kind of uses that you can't do anywhere else, like kite surfing, kite whatever. Um, and uh, it's always uh, an interesting experience of, of how the, the weather exactly develops and, and, and approaches the city. So I think it feels like being in nature, although it's so part of, of the, the city as well. So uh, coming back to the pioneers, so this is like the official call or kind of description from the Senate about the pioneer uses. Uh, there was a, a new uh, uh, company, the Temple of Project Limited, installed. Which is a development agency. Uh, their main task was to to focus on a strategi strategic planning, to legislate building law, to provide measures of infrastructure, and to distribute the site for real estate developments. Um, because what happened, like after the, the financial crisis in 2007 and 8, that a lot of money came back on the real estate market, especially in Berlin. So what they did actually, they just uh, put the study in the archive. <coughs> and went back to the kind of business as usual. And I, I think they, 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 inst they installed the pioneer uh, areas, but more as a kind of marketing tool, to s uh, because I think it, it fits to the image of Berlin to have these kind of cool users that are kind of so creative and whatever. So just to show you how the pioneer areas look like, this is one um, called Ein Mendekontor. I think it's the biggest one. Uh, they have uh, parties as well, and uh, they have, I think, 800 members. And uh, what you can see, obviously, it's, it's not about it's not about design. <laughs> it's more about creating a space. And what I really like is that it's open. So um, there's no fence around this area. So everybody who who comes can have a seat, sit down. Even I mean, a friend of mine has has a garden here. He said, "Oh, he, he only can." harvest like at most 40 to 50 percent of his garden, the rest goes to the kind of public, so it's a sort of uh, a common, so common ground, <laughs> uh, maybe the tragedy of the commons. So, but I think this is quite nice about this area and most of the others. And on the other hand, it's not that they, they, they really have to pay some money to, to use the land. It's not like they get it for free. So, and uh, there was really not a deal or like a discussion on eye level. So that's why I, I think the whole concept failed to some extent, at least in the way we thought it. 
Here you can see some other projects which have more kind of a, a notion of buildings. This is an interesting uh, pavilion because it uses the Bauhaus facade from Dessau. This is kind of the historic Gropius facade because this was taken out uh, to uh, make it new to the uh, German energy uh, uh, laws. And then I took it. And this is a nice combination f f uh, out of uh, East German and West German concrete slabs, making a new pavilion. And I, I think what I mentioned before is this is how um, uh, they presented themselves. And this uh, tells about the, the actors on the Temple of Area. And uh, they, they mention uh, the Senate of Urban Development, uh, the Development Agency's Temple of Projects, and Green Berlin. But no words about the pioneers. So uh, even if we, we, we thought about that we gave them a lot of tools how to communicate and develop this, there was no, no dialogue on an eye level, like I said before. And um, uh, I think this is why, why the whole thing failed. And I think there are kind of complete different ideas of uh, what participation means, because this was a pavilion that was installed, I think, in 2009 or 10 in front of the, the Schillerkeets, which was actually the, the, the neighborhood which was really kind of afraid of the changes that might come up with the opening of the airport. And um, mm -hmm. What they presented there was basically like top-down planning processes, like plans from competitions that had been kind of developed over the years, and people were invited to comment on it, but this is uh, kind of different. So some people did not agree on this form of uh, participation, and what they did is like uh, vandalizing the whole pavilion, because for them it seemed to be kind of provocation. But on the other hand, what came up as well out of the kind of pioneers, uh, was an initiative called 100% uh, Tempelhof. That they wanted to um, to participate in the planning process in a different way, and their goal was to to keep the whole site open, not allowing any urban development. And they did it quite quite uh, professional. So they they started a referendum process, and they managed in the first stage to collect the number of signatures of entitled voters, which is necessary to to conduct the referendum, and uh, finally they were successful, so which means that there will be no urban developments on the Temple of Ophel for the next years. That's, they, they made an, a law which says like nothing will be kind of, um, it's, nothing can be built up there for next year. So this is the new zoning plan. This is how it looks now. So uh, but for me it was sort of, of or for us, uh, being involved in the, in the um, study, we had a kind of a laughing eye and a weeping eye at the same time. Laughing because we really uh, were happy with the result of a referendum, because uh, it stopped the process of this kind of implementing the master plan. And weeping because uh, we were not too convinced about uh, the idea of keeping the status quo, because it always is a kind of uh, an idea of conservation. Because, and, and to us, uh, urban life means change, diversity, and contraction, uh, contradiction. And uh, our goal was more to, to invent or develop a new way of kind of making city. But I think this might happen in the future. So at least they made no mistakes. <laughs> okay, I have to speed up. Um, this is a small building uh, which we developed in cooperation with an artist as his home and studio. The title plays with the idea of luxury and the, the concept of of prefabricated houses, which in Germany, maybe in Switzerland as well, are usually suburban and middle class and have funny names like Sweden or Black Forest or Bavaria to, communi to communicate a, a certain style. That's what we tried as well. And refer to uh, our former uh, governing major, who said uh, Berlin is poor but sexy. So I think it's really nice to say a uh, penthouse Berlin, uh, I, I think was the perfect kind of m match, do you say, of bringing two, two terms together to describe uh, poor and sexy. And on the other hand, it reflects uh, a different idea of luxury. So Christian, who was the client or sort of client, he said, it's an outdated notion of luxury to, that my whole life has to take place at 20 degrees. So he wanted to really define uh, a new place of experimental housing. 
So, uh, and how this happened was that he uh, made some money for leaving his old studio before end of the contract. And he was really tired of being pushed around by the market moving from one place to the next. And he decided to become a developer himself, like as an art artistic project, and, um, and he wanted to make a political statement. So uh, the most difficult thing was to find an um, appropriate rooftop, uh, which was not usable for any development uh, with an existing access and available for long-term lease because Christian didn't want to buy a kind of property. Uh, we, we were sort of successful after like half a year or even longer and find this rooftop which uh, used to have a, an extra story for the World War II, which was like bombed away. So um, uh, this was actually the, the, the perfect roof and uh, we uh, were really optimistic doing the planning and uh, then we found out it's quite difficult to get the permission because um, or we, we ended up with the kind of guy that was really complicated in because usually we have the, there's the law and within the law there's always a kind of uh, space to to well, agree or disagree on things and negotiate, but he was I think he was only kind of uh, anxious to make a mistake. And uh, but once kind of started, we we, we didn't give didn't give up and we showed up like every two weeks uh, at the administration. And at some point, I know we got the permission. I know if we convinced him or he just gave up. So um, uh, the project needed to be really low budget. So uh, our approach was about like self-building. On the left side, this is like uh, Christian, our client. And uh, it was driven by like uh, recycled uh, products uh, like windows. And he, before we started, he had already like 10 windows uh, on eBay. And then he sent me all the DIY offers. Uh, and uh, he was traveling a lot these days. And he brought like funny things from, from China. Um, and this needs to go in the project as well. And um, I got really interested in, in low budget uh, building structures to use them as a kind of a technical approach to produce, to produce space. And uh, driven by the minimal budget, we developed a concept uh, with available space changes with the seasons, which is quite uh, clear. So winter, you have the, the two cores, uh, spring, no, autumn and spring, you have like the, the whole greenhouse and in summer you have the whole area with the rooftop, which is a bit wrong because this space gets really hot in summer. So I think uh, <laughs> this was an experience or a learning I had. So, um, and then um, th this, this concept having these two cores allowed us to, to bypass the, the term energy saving law because we were too small. And then that's why we, we always, if, if you have to, you have the laws, you have to address them. So, and I think you always have to, you can look for the loopholes and look around. And I think this is what I, I really like to do. Um, so here you can see the kind of uh, basic setup of the building. And actually, I think the main design decision was how to place the building on the rooftop for me to create different spaces, like the space in between the new greenhouse and existing uh, stairwell and uh, we only did like one or two details uh, that were necessary to make the kind of the, the structure uh, for the structural engineer <laughs> and the rest was developed like operationally so this was like the, the, the building kit of the, the greenhouse so this is how it uh, looked from a distance here you can see like uh, the two cores and the kind of the metal structure around and at some point uh, because he's an artist and an artist are kind of uh, different, and he came up with this funny idea of having this uh, fireplace in his greenhouse. Um, this came with an email. Uh, the headline was "No shit, man," and I was quite surprised. And this is what he did finally. <laughs> I mean, he's always serious about what 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 he wants to do, and I think I, as an architect, couldn't have done it because I mean, even the details. He he glued the kind of stone tiles on top of his aluminium frame. Which is actually quite nice, but it's a, it's a collage. It, I, I think it makes the whole thing interesting and kind of more a comment, like a kind of serious gesture. And this is how they uh, presented themselves uh, as the new urban nobility. And uh, this is how it looks from the inside. 
some images. And uh, like I mentioned before, this is an experimental housing, so you really get confronted with different uh, external influences. So this was the first New Year's Eve uh, when the rocket hit the, the roof, which is only like a two layers of plastic foil. So you always need a kind of uh, roll of tape to, to stick the holes. And, and, and finally, this project led to a study about low-cost building structures for artists, uh, which was commissioned by the Senate of Urban Development. So Nancy has a copy now, so if you're interested, <laughs> maybe you can borrow it from her. <laughs> so, um, are you still kind of? Yeah, yeah. So, uh, I have another like 60 slides. <laughs> Oh, we always can say stuff, and then yeah. it's okay. <laughs> so this is, but maybe this is, uh, I think, for me at the moment, the most interesting project I'm, I'm involved. It's called uh, Die Gärtnerei, which is, um, I think it's, it's a nursery in English. Uh, it's a project we started in 2014 as a collaboration between the, the Cultural Center Schlesische 27 and, and Raumlabor. It is a project uh, for and with refugees. Here we did uh, the Taz Lab. Um, setting at the Haus der Kultur in der Welt this year. Taz is a kind of newspaper in Berlin and they have a kind of yearly conference at the Haus der Kultur in der Welt and this time they ask us to do the kind of the setup. Um, actually the Gettner is a follow-up project of a temporary community center which we did in summer 2014 as an open structure which was pretty inspired by, by Jona Friedman. So we just offered this kind of scaffolding structure which uh, could be kind of uh, inhabited within four weeks by different people from the neighborhood and different initiatives, clubs, associations. I think these are my kind of favorite users, like the knitting uh, association from the neighborhood, but even like bands were coming and performing, um, uh, creating diversity, uh, and uh, we had an ongoing dialogue about the neighborhood and how this could be developed. So we thought it might be really good to, to um, make another project, but we weren't quite quite sure about what we do. So this is where the the arena was. This is Tempelhof area, so we were close to the Tempelhof area. And um, we were kind of still in conversation with the uh, Protestant Church of Berlin. They own both of the kind of, these are cemeteries, former cemeteries, and they're kind of this is completely empty, and this is partly empty, and they, they offered us that we could use part of the site uh, on the cemetery. So um, we, we thought about um, developing a project we called like, or we, we started a garden, but not a garden like a urban gardening, but it's more like of, about growing flowers, because um, uh, I think it's always about how to <laughs> kind of implement micro-businesses and bypass the, the existing regulations. So I think by growing flowers, it could have been kind of very easy approach to to give them away and get some, how do you say, spenden? Uh, donations. donations. So, uh, but actually, uh, it was quite interesting because the refugees, they were not too keen on growing flowers. They wanted to grow food. So maybe it's more kind of close to them. And I was, I felt sort of kind of mm, funny about growing food on the cemetery. But um, no problem. So, uh, but I think the basic goals, I mean, I just um, have the, some bullet points, you can read them and I go on uh, talking. Uh, I think for us, I think the most crucial point, this was before the massive uh, influx of people from Syria started, but I think it was quite clear. I mean, there were already some refugees and some many refugees in Berlin, there had, but there was a camp on Oranian Platz. And um, so it was quite clear that this kind of, worth to think about this kind of topic. And I, I think the biggest problem always is that uh, these people can't do anything. They are, they are kind of forced to, to do nothing and wait. And uh, that's why we, we, we thought uh, we have to create um, a place which offers or allows people to work. And uh, as a base for maybe later uh, vocational training to, to teach them German. So the, the whole idea was to create something like a school, because this was based on the experience Barbara, our partner, had with some other projects. Uh, she said that if they work, they want to get paid. So this is kind of their culture. And if they learn, it's part of a school. So the whole thing was actually 
following the idea of a school. And I think it was quite interesting because in the beginning I thought, well, we teach them. And after a while you, you realize, well, they teach us as well. And after a while, another while you, you experience, well, the whole thing is like a, a, a learning process because we don't have any idea about how we can uh, uh, integrate or even make inclusive processes for, for these people. So um, this actually tries to describe, I'm not too happy, but uh, how the whole thing uh, is organized. So we have a kind of project management with workshop leaders as a kind of basic structure and uh, we, we have a core team of participants like the refugees that come, kind of, they oblige themselves to come every day and to, to learn and work with us. And then there are a lot of volunteers like the teachers or other workshop leaders and people from the neighborhood, they, they really get involved in this, in this project. And this refers back to the, to the idea of um, creating something for the community, which was like the first project before, like the scaffolding thing. So, um, uh, for, for developing the garden, we, we implemented a method that we call uh, incremental design. That means to develop a design step by step, allowing to take uh, new things on board, like experiences, knowledge, material, whatever. So, um, uh, and in order to change design or to change the hierarchy within a design, which is quite quite interesting, because we usually as an architect we try to, to plan everything into the detail, and uh, I think we, we learn to, to to leave nothing open because then we can have control. So I think architectural design is very often about control and I think this is the other way around, just to be open to what happens. And I think it's a need here. <coughs> so uh, I think we started really conceptual making, staking a claim. Uh, and uh, then we, we asked a, a guy with a big plow coming to, to turn around the soil and to visualize uh, the, the change. And then uh, the whole um, a garden started to be developed, but not in the way we, we conceived it in the beginning, like this kind of flowers coming and being like a one color flower garden. So there were a lot of discu discussions going on about um, what kind of plants we use. We have to, create, have to create diversity and we don't want to have a kind of monocultural thing like you decide, so this is just bullshit and so on. So I think the whole garden developed by, by different kind of arguments, um, it still was kind of conceived in rows, um, but um, not really planned as we conceived as architects. I speed up a little bit. So just to describe, this is always what we try to do to, to rationalize our kind of process. So this was like the claiming as a really conceptual approach then the blowing to make it visible, then the cultivating in rows. What happened then was like uh, we, we built a, a bridge. And I think this is, was quite interesting because we thought what we wanted to do is to connect the trees in the garden and um, make a connection to the main axis. But what happened, this, this bridge kind of really kind of exploded the kind of framing that we conceived before. And, but then actually the garden became quite, quite nice. And I think this was uh, interesting. So, but what we try to do is always to rationalize what, we, what happens and to, to document uh, step by step. So, uh, and, and I think the whole project is really defined by making. This was the very first meeting we did. With the, with the people and we invited all people that might be interesting and they, they, they did a kind of first cleaning and, and renovation of the building. And just to describe you the, the daily practice, usually it's kind of uh, jam glasses in the morning, then uh, garden work in the afternoon. So um, like I said before, no flowers, only little flowers, a lot of lettuce, mint and things that they can eat. So and um, by not having a sufficient funding, we always depend on material which is available for free. So in this uh, situation, we got a, um, how do you say, a, a stall from the from a trade fair, like the SAP, and this was there for like five days, and it's it's really uh, I don't know a waste of material. But this we used to, to build this kind of bridge. But always, like I said, uh, at some point the material ends and you have to stop and wait. There's kind of not, a new, uh, new material coming up. Um, 
And the other thing is that, I mean, the bridge ended up to become very high in uh, becoming the stage we can see here and the table at the same time. So it, it's really is the center of the, the, the garden. I'm speeding up. Like another drawing that we, we make, it's not, for the, it's not for planning, it's more like for capture what, what was happening and to develop the next step for the, for the garden. So like the bridge in the beginning, we, we, it stopped here and we said it's such a big gesture, it needs something at the end. So we, we start to build this kind of tribune and access here with a kind of informal access with a ladder into the cemetery. So it's always about inventing and developing. Um, then we have artistic workshops to communicate cultural education as well. It's part of a thing, it's not only a labor camp, it uh, is fun as well. And, and, and like common cooking is, uh, uh, I think the most uh, important daily routine to, to share like recipes and the ex uh, experience of cooking and but eating together as well. And then this shows um, a project that we did in a workshop with students from San Francisco. This was students from I think design and uh, economics and they, they developed a kind of a business plan based on a kiosk. Then we uh, this is what designed this what we made the kiosk within a week and then they use it to uh, flowers, <laughs> food and honey. We have bees in the meanwhile. And uh, it's they, people can just take it and give donations. So it's next to the street. So and I think I'm speeding up, sorry. This is how we uh, started to improve the building. On material we got from an exhibition design we did for the Hamburger Bahnhof about the Black Mountain College. So, and the idea of reusing the material was always part of our initial concept. And I think uh, one of the most uh, important things is uh, a regular event called Cafe Nana. And Nana is uh, a Bambara word for, for mint. So, um, in order to open the Gärtnerei to a wider public, so we, for each event we define a specific topic that uh, is suggested by the refugees in order to give them the chance to tell us about their culture. And uh, so they, they are hosting the events to give them the idea of responsibility and getting a notion of ownership, which is quite, I think, a crucial part of the education. And this was like last Saturday, like two days ago, we had a kind of neighborhood academy called Nana Academy, where we brought our, maybe this is one of the most known Ramlova projects, the, the kitchen monument. We brought into the garden and had a kind of, uh, uh, like workshop situation and uh, presentations in the evening and common cooking. And this is uh, always quite nice <laughs> and atmospheric. So the next step is what I would call a, a Trojan greenhouse, using uh, the structure of a greenhouse as an envelope for, for new programs like housing or kind of experimental housing, or it's a kind of project space. And this is for two reasons. First, as it is by planning law still a cemetery, so we can get the permission for, for we can we can get the permission for a greenhouse, but not for almost any other building structure and program. And uh, the second is we don't want to implement the final design. It's more by um, offering an envelope and then shaping the the content in the process. So and this is really kind of. Uh, what the greenhouse, uh, like you've seen before, has a, a lot of opportunities. It offers a lot of, a lot of profit, offers a lot of uh, opportunities. So, and what I'm excited about, because I mean, this is really abstract drawing uh, from the whole situation. Here's our kind of school building. Here's a garden. Here's a new building coming up, built by the church, a refugee housing project. And uh, at some point, I realized as the whole area here is going to be developed with housing, so there's a big chance to, to get involved because uh, after being there for two years, we have really a voice in our stakeholder in this process. So the idea is one is like to, to make the greenhouse here, uh, maybe right now being a greenhouse, but maybe in two years or five years time, um, it's a community center or indoor playground or whatever. So I think this would be, um, one of the learnings from the Temple of kind of um, study to implement this process of, of a learning urbanism, uh, urbanism here at the, at the Gatna High. So this is like our, our working process. So this is probably how 
different blocks like look like. So uh, we, we, it's not quite defined yet, but uh, I think it might be somehow like this, a different kind of areas. So what we tried is to, to place the greenhouse in, in a way that it, it fits in sort of the structure and it's not in, in the way of when they do the first step. So and then, they, then we need to move. And um, so um, this is, like I said in the beginning, it's a self-initiated project and it needs financing every like two years. So in the first two years we had the fun, uh, funding from the Federal Cultural Foundation of Germany and then uh, IKEA uh, Foundation is funding us with the greenhouse. And for the next year, we need another one. And uh, so this is a drawing to, to create an idea of a um, coming up neighborhood with different kind of spots of, of public interaction as a kind of the core of the neighborhood. This is really more about creating a narrative. It's not like designed yet. So it's just to convince people to give us their money. So I, I think I'm going to stop now, although there's another project. and. I'm just saying, I never managed to, to pre present actually this project, but thank you. <laughs> mm -hmm.